morning, everybody. We are in the book of Judges this morning. By way of quick review, kind of where we're at, God decided to choose a people for himself in Genesis. We know those people to be Israel, the Jews, through Abraham, chose them not because they're big, but actually chose them because they're small people. He even tells them that. So he chose uh, cute little fellas to be his nation, cute little fellas and gals, and we have the start of that nation. Well, things progress where they end up in Egypt. In Egypt, they are put to task to serve the Egyptians uh, harshly. They had to do a lot of labor. They are brought out of Egypt by way of Moses being used by God. They wander the desert for 40 years. Moses brings them to the edge of the land that God had promised Abraham. And then Joshua brings them into the land, the conquest, into the land where they do a pretty good job. They do not do a wholehearted, full job of taking the land. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1 says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. So there we have an obituary to begin Joshua. And Joshua eventually is the guy that brings him into the land, right? Now go to Judges chapter 1. So Joshua 1.1 1, 1 begins with Moses dies. And then there's Joshua. Judges begins with, in Judges 1.1, 1, 1, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them. Judges begins with an obituary, and it is the death of Joshua. Judges covers about 300 years. If you go back to page 4, we have a series of dates back there. And if you look the third one down, the period of the Judges was roughly 1375 to really 1075, but it kind of carries over into the book of Samuel and the time of the king. So you basically have a 300-year period that is represented in the book of Judges. Moses dies, Joshua. Joshua dies, and then all hell breaks loose. If there's a book of the Bible that we would like to throw away, it's the book of Judges. It has been said that it is a very difficult book. And I wonder sometimes what makes it difficult. Is it difficult because the stories are rough? Or is it difficult because it's a mirror? And we will go over some things. I wrote so many notes on my notes. And it was hard to know where to land with all of the stuff. Because there's, there's so much to be learned here. It's so practical, it's, it's scary. I mean, it is so simple that it's scary, but yet it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible, the book of Judges. What happens to the people? In Joshua, you have victory. They go into the land. In Judges, you have defeat. In Joshua, you have motivation to go into the land. In Judges, you have an attitude of just maintaining whatever. In Joshua, they're mobilized to go in. Well, in Judges, they're settled into the land. They begin to settle poorly. Joshua, you have unity. In Judges, you have disunity. In Joshua, they're conquering. In Judges, the land is theirs. There's kind of this lack of motivation for stuff. In Joshua, they're fighters. In Judges, there's no fight. In Joshua, there's patriotism. In Judges, who cares? 
That's the attitude that we're going to deal with this morning. Glad everybody showed up here in such a good mood. I'm now going to take you down low into the pits because we're going to go through Judges, the book that's hard to handle because God wanted to do so much, yet the people just wouldn't go there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We are grateful for the lessons that we can see in your word. They challenge us to make wise decisions. Lord, I pray that as we come to know the cycle of judges, the downward cycle that was repeated over and over and over, Lord, help us to be mindful of our own lives. Help us to be mindful of where we are in the cycle, because no doubt we're in it somewhere. Father, I pray that you would help us to look boldly into the mirror this morning. Boldly look at ourselves and decide who we want to be, where we are, and the changes that we need to make. So, Father, we ask that this book would be uplifting because it will cause growth in each and every one of us. Thank you for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In your notes, page 7, Judges. The book of Judges shows the downward spiral of the nation as, quote, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 2.11. During this time, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them, Judges 2.16. Judges, when we think about it today, we think of somebody that's supposed to be honorable. We all stand when they enter the room, right? You have kind of this picture of a judge. Not quite so in the book of Judges. These were people that were raised up. They wrote things. They counseled in things. They did things that were 2023 judge-like, but they were raised up by God to help deliver the people of Israel out of tough times. So judges is hard when you look at it like, isn't a judge a courtroom guy and, or a courtroom gal? And Well, sort of, but these judges were a little different. These were people that were raised up and God enabled them to do things to deliver the nation out of tough times. Despite the chances given by the Lord, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Key verse for judges, theme verse for judges, is Judges 17.6. In those days there was no king in Israel. We believe that Judges was written most likely by Samuel, the author, and we'll get into that a little bit. At, the, at that time, there was no king in Israel. That's something that's going to happen in the future. So the author here is probably looking back at the time of Judges when he wrote it. Hey, remember the time there was no king? That's kind of what he's saying. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Look at 18.1. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites, who was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in, for until that day their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. Look at 19.1. And it came to pass in those days there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite saying in the remote mountains of Ephraim, he took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Horrible chapter. We're going to come back to this one. 21-25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Such a sad sad period of time. Joshua 23 and verses 5 through 8 says, And the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out of your sight, so you shall possess their land as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore be courageous to keep 
and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. And lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods. Don't even talk about them, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. Well, we fast forwarded a little while ago. How'd they do? Terrible. God very plainly, through the book of Joshua, tells them what to do, right? Letter A in your notes, the background. Judges was written by an unknown prophet around 1000 BC, sometime after the death of the last character in the book, Samson, around 1051 BC. The writing was during the time of the kings, which started in 1051 B.C. We know this because of the phrase, in those days there was no king in Israel, which is used four times. Judges 17, 6, 18, 1, 19, 1, 21, 25, which is what we looked at. Tradition has assigned the authorship to Samuel. If it was not Samuel, it was someone contemporary to Samuel. Judges is a book of history that shows righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14, 34. Judges bridges the gap from Joshua to the beginning of the monarchy, the time of the kings. If we look at the outline there, we have very simple outline. We have the introduction to the area of the, of the, the era of the judges, Judges 1 through 2 where we have the condition of the nation of Israel in chapter 1, and God reveals Israel's cycle, which we will go over in a minute, chapter 2. We have the era of the judges, Judges 3 through 16. And then the results of the era of the judges is confusion, Judges 17 through 21. The theme and content. Key verses, Judges 2.19, which again, if I look at that, Judges 2.19, and it came to pass... When the judge was dead, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And then 17.6, we read earlier, there was no king and everyone did whatever they wanted. When the cat's away, the mice will play, right? So if we look at the theme of the book, we have a few things that I want to go over. We have what's in your notes, and then I want to add a couple things. We have a period of rest, and then rebellion kicks in, and then retribution or punishment kicks in, and then there's repentance, and restoration. And then it keeps going over and over and over. Go to chapter 2. We look at what happened to the nation where they were disobedient to drive all of the inhabitants out. God said you will drive them all out. Did they? No. As a result, idolatry sets in. They are okay with the other gods that are in the land. Instead of driving out the people, having nothing to do with those gods, they're there, they're in the land, they don't drive out the bad people with the false gods. So the door is open to idolatry, and they're like, eh, is it so bad? They begin to intermarry with those makes it even easier. Hey, I tell you what, if it'll keep my spouse happy, yep, we'll leave the idol on the shelf. Yep, we'll worship false gods and things. So we have this cycle. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bachem and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you into the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. 
Verse 2, And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side. And their gods shall be a snare to you. Verse 7. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. Verse 10. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Baals, other gods. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods. Verse 13, they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreths. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who spoiled them, and he sold them into the hand of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Let's start going through a process here. Verse 11 is disobedience. The children did evil in the sight of the Lord. We're going to go through an entire process of what happens in our lives by what we see here in the text. Verse 11 starts with disobedience. Verse 14 then becomes bondage. You become enslaved to things because of your disobedience. When you open that door, you're going to be under bondage of addiction, under bondage of bad relationships, whatever. God puts them into bondage. The anger of the Lord was hot, so he delivered them into the hands of plunderers who spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so they could no longer stand before their enemies. Verse 15, what happens? Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity. As the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. The word distressed there is literally depressed, heavy laden. So it starts with disobedience where you open the door, you then become enslaved to what you allow in, and that causes calamity in your life. Verse 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods. Verse 18, And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for the Lord was moved to pity. Here we have deliverance and rest. God helps them out. Verse 19, And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers. By following other gods to serve them and bow down to them, they did not cease from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And again, and again, and again. That's the cycle. So you go from disobedience to bondage. You go from bondage to depression. You go from depression where God delivers you, and then you start to compromise again. Once you start compromising, what happens? You start living a life of leisure. I don't have to put on, say, the armor of God today. I don't have to read my Bible today. I don't have to go to church anymore. I can take all things light because God has brought me to a place where things are okay now. So what can I do? I can just relax. I can lower my guard. I can live a life of leisure. But then what happens when you live a life of leisure? You start to become selfish. Selfishness starts to come in and we start thinking, well, Things are okay, so now I'm going to start claiming my time for me because things are okay, so I will hold on to my stuff. I will hold on to my time. I will hold on to my talents. I will do whatever I want to do. 
It's all about me again. So you grow complacent. Then there's apathy. And then there's dependence. And then weakness. And when the weakness comes, disobedience. And now we're back at the beginning. Disobedience, bondage, depression, deliverance and rest. We compromise, life of leisure, selfish, complacent, apathy, dependence, weakness. That's the cycle. Where are you on the cycle? Where am I on the cycle? It's so easy to fall in this. It's so easy. Go back to chapter 1 and verse 1. This is erosion. You ever see a picture online of some beachfront and they show you a hundred years ago and they show you now and this erosion happens? You could stand there all day long and don't realize erosion is happening while you're standing on the sand. It's happening. But we don't really see it, so we don't really pay it much attention. But erosion in our lives happens just like a beach. And all of a sudden you can figure out five years passes or a year. Sometimes it's only a couple months and you realize, how did I get here? My marriage is shot. My job is shot. My relationships are terrible. Everything in life, whatever, you get to this point, you're like, what happened? Erosion. Erosion happened. And all these steps just kind of led you in, and slowly but surely, your life was being chopped into another step, another stage. Judges 1.1, 1, 1. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Where's the, where's the killer instinct? Do you realize what they're asking here? Okay, um... Who wants to go first? Weakness. Verse 2, And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. In the military, we call this being volunteered. Judah, you are going. Thanks for volunteering. I have delivered the land into his hand. Sad situation. It started right there at the beginning of the book. It wasn't like, hey, let's go. It's no. Um, we don't want to be first. Who wants to be first? We see this attitude that permeates. I want to go through, finish the notes, which if you go to page 8, there's this cycle that happens with the judges. And I want to go through the book and start talking about some of the things that happen in this book and looking at the cycle that happens. But there we have on page 8 in your notes this cycle of the judges. We have oppressors, we have judges, the passages where all of the judges were raised up. But chapter 3 and verse 1, Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. They go into the land, they do not conquer the whole land. So what does God do? God says, I'm now going to leave them there to test Israel, to see if they're going to be obedient. You made this bed, now I'm going to test you by it. You have, you have decided to live with these people that I warned you about. They're going to lead you astray. That's what happens. Verse 4 of chapter 3. And they were left that he might test Israel by them, to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord. Verse 5, Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebuvites, the Stalactites, the Termites. The, there's a lot of ites all over the place. And they lived all among them. All these people are just left there. And they took their daughters to be their wives. What? and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. Ah, man. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the, land, into the hand of Cushan, 
Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served them eight years. Verse 9, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel. Here's your first judge. Verse 11, so the land, so this judge is raised up. The spirit of the Lord, verse 10, came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered the king of Mesopotamia into his hand and his hand prevailed. Verse 11, so the land had rest for 40 years. Here's the cycle. We messed up. We cry out to God because of our disobedience and because we messed up. God delivers, there's rest. Verse 12, and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 14, so the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years, but the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and God raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud. Verse 17, so he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, and when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute, but he himself turned back from the stone images that were in Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him, and Ehud, the judge, came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. Mafia style. You ready? I got a message for you, Don Corleone. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade. What a good story. Junior high kids love the Old Testament. For he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Mission accomplished. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. So there's one. Verse 28, then he said to them, follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab. Verse 30, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Didn't we just hear this? After him was Shamgar. So now we're at Shamgar, another judge. And he also delivered Israel. Very interesting things happen. Go to chapter 4 and verse 21. During these cycles, things were sporty. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. Wow. Good thing she went softly to him. Drove the peg through his head and into the ground. Go to chapter 5 and verse 31. At the very end of the verse. So the land had rest for 40 years. Another cycle come and gone. 6 verse 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up also, Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them, destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance for Israel neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. Verse 6, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Sometimes you think, boy, the nerve of these people, right? Verse 11, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, 
the Ebers right, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I would love for God to refer to me at that. This is amazing. Verse 15. So he said to him, O my Lord, how can I serve Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Verse 23. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Go to chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early in the encampment beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many. Verse 3, Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 20,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whoever I say, This one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men, who lap, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Verse 8, So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hand, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. When you graduate the police academy in Tulsa, our chaplain goes through this story and talks about sometimes it's the very few that will stand in the gap and fight uh, to take on so many. Verse 16, then he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put, you ready? We're going to arm you. And he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. Huh. All right. Verse 19, so Gideon and the 100 men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And there we have an amazing, crazy defeat by way of pitchers and torches and things like that. The saga continues. Go to 8, verse 27. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city. Ophra and all Israel played the harlot with it there. Here we go again. The cycle continues, right? So we have these cycles that go on. Go to ver or chapter 13, verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did evil. In the sight of the Lord. Verse 24. So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. 14.5. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise a young lion came roaring against him. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he tore the lion apart. As one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. That is strong. I don't care who you are. Chapter 15, verse 9. Now the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. Verse 11. 
Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? Verse 12, But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Verse 13, So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you secretly and deliver you into their hands, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. Verse 14, And he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him, then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand, and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. I don't care who you are, that's strength and stamina. Go to chapter 16. Now Samson, verse 1, went to Gaza. Verse 4, afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. I always think of uh, Tom Jones and his song Delilah when I hear Delilah. I can't get that. Verse 6, so Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Men, if anybody ever says, tell me what makes you strong and how I can take your strength away, don't do it. If you don't see the, just the badness of that, the, that's just a terrible question. Verse 7, And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Verse 8, So the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Let's just fast forward. He gets out of those. Verse 11, So he said to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes, Fast forward, he gets out of those. Verse 13, at the end, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, fast forward, he gets out of those. So he's lying to her and she's not happy. Verse 15, Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Oh, Delilah, you have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies, because I'm only doing this in love. Verse 17, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Verse 19, then she lulled him to sleep on her knees, and called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Verse 21, The Philistines took him, and put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Now the Lord of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God. Go to verse 25. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. And they stationed him between two pillars, between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by hand, Let me feel the pillars which support the temple, so that I can lean on them. Samson has got a plan. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women, on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. 
and he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. Samson, one of the last, or really the last judge in the book of Judges that we see. Chapter 17, this is terrible. Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. Not Micah that you think of, this is a different Micah. And he said to his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from you, and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, Here is the silver with me, I took it. And his mother said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my son, for your stealing of the silver. Interesting. Verse 3, so when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image. It's directly against the law of God. And a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. You see the downward spiral that we talked about earlier. These people are just nuts. Like, who's doing what? Who's in charge? Verse 5, the man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah. Of the family of Judah, he was a Levite and was staying there. Who is this guy? He's a priest. Verse 9, And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, Dwell with me, and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you ten shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite. Are you serious? Now we have some guy consecrating a priest. It's supposed to be the other way around. Even the priests went nuts. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as priest. That's not how you do it. It's not how it works. It's not how any of this works. Chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah, but his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there four whole months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having his servants and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day, arose early in the morning, and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread. Let's go to chapter, or verse 20, 1920. And the old man said, Peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. So he brought him into his house and gave fodder to the donkeys. And they washed their feet and ate and drank. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house, that we may know him carnally. So men wanting to have sex with the man in the house. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. So he's basically taking his wife and claiming that she's a virgin daughter. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please, but to this man do not do such a vile thing. 
But the men would not heed him. So the man took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. This is rape all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. When her master arose in the morning, he opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. There was his concubine, fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, get up and let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey and the man got up and went to his place. She's dead, by the way. When he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt. Until this day, consider it, confer, and speak up. What happens when you go in a downward spiral? Complete anarchy is in the future. Complete anarchy. Here you have a guy that's like, take my concubine. They rape her to the point where she dies. And now this guy decides he's going to cut her up. And he's going to send pieces of her all over the place. Chapter 20, verse 3. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. Then the children of Israel said, Tell us, how did this wicked deed happen? Verse 6, So I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the territory of the inheritance of Israel, because they committed lewdness and outrage in Israel. What happens from this? Israel starts to get angry, and they start to come together, and it leads to thousands and thousands and thousands of people dying. Why? Because of a downward spiral that started with, we're in the land, who wants to go first? Complete anarchy is achieved. Go to chapter 20 and verse 44. It says, and 18,000 men of Benjamin fell during these battles. Because of what was done, all these men were raised up to fight against what had happened because they received pieces of this woman. Verse 48, And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword from every city, men and beasts, all who were found. They also set fire to all the cities they came to. Complete anarchy. Go to 21:25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Complete anarchy. Having looked at judges and the cycle of judges where all it takes is a little room for bad things to start, right? You start getting complacent. You start, you start allowing yourself, you give yourself permission to slip. It's okay. It's okay. I need to be around other believers. I need to be in His Word. I need to build up the church. Do I? Do I really? Does it really matter? There's the open door. There's the downward cycle. People that were once in church, and now they're, you're like, how did they get there? Sam Kinison. You remember Sam Kinison, the comedian? Filthy comedian. Started out as a preacher. How did he get to where he ended up? It's a downward spiral. Romans 5, starting in verse 3. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. What if we read that differently? And not only that, but we also whine and complain. 
in tough times. Knowing that whining and complaining produces apathy, frustration, a downward spiral. So therefore, we're not persevering. Quite the opposite. We're going downward. We're not holding fast to God like God said in Joshua. Hold fast. We're not doing that. So what does it do? It, 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 it produces negative. It doesn't produce perseverance. It produces the downward spiral. And because we're not doing that, it doesn't produce character. What does it produce? Sin. It produces sinfulness. It produces unrighteous living. It produces all of that. And character, it's supposed to produce hope, but now it doesn't produce hope. It produces despair. It produces, why doesn't God, why doesn't God do something in my life? Why doesn't God lead me to, and all of a sudden you have no hope. Where is God in my life? Why is life so difficult for me? We have a pattern that produces good stuff to step up, but if you read it negatively, it produces no hope in your life. You don't have a hope. What am I supposed to do with my life? I don't have any hope. I know. And I know how you got there. It was erosion. You were standing on the very beach that was being taken out from underneath your feet. You didn't see it. You didn't see it. Life was moving along and five years went by and all of a sudden, you don't know anything in the Bible. You attended a church that was like water to a drowning man. They don't teach the Bible there. They give you complacency. They give you comfortableness. They give you... And what happens? All of a sudden, life is difficult. You have trials and you don't know what to do with them because you weren't taught. You don't see the purpose in them. You don't see God in your life. It's a downward spiral. Judges. Man, it'd be nice if we could rip that out and... No, I don't want that. I don't want that to be real. I don't want this pattern to be real in life, but it is. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, the end of the book. Ecclesiastes is amazing because I think in the, uh, the order that they're put in the Bible, I think they're the opposite. It goes Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. I think they were written Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs. Ecclesiastes in the middle as as Solomon is, has lived much of his life, what does he say? Verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. This is a book that he basically says, everything is worthless. Life is such a vapor of nothingness. It's all pointless when you live under the sun. But if you add God into your life, everything under the sun is vanity. But when you include God into your life, you go above the sun, basically, S-U-N. And you invite God into your life, there's purpose for everything. There's a reason for everything. You invite God into your life. So what does he say at the end of the book after he, he says, yeah, you're going to be frustrated. It's all vanity, nothing mean. Yeah, you live, you save up a bunch of money, and then you die. You don't even get to enjoy your stuff. The conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all. It's his all. It's everything. If you're not growing, you're probably on the cycle somewhere in Judges. If your all isn't into God, you're probably on the cycle, depending on where you are. You're treading water in your leisure, maybe. Verse 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. The downward spiral of judges, it's a sad story. They had come into the land as conquerors, mostly. They conquered most of the land, but what God said when he said, I want you to destroy everything that breathes. Why? Because God hates everything that breathes? No, because God wants to be first, and he knows that the book of Judges is coming. If you don't do it, Judges. Complete anarchy, where thousands are killed because 
somebody was raped until death and she was chopped into pieces. What? Like plot twist in a movie. It's like you're watching a love story or a good movie about how the good guys won, they conquered a land, and then all of a sudden you get to a period of time that ends with a woman being chopped up after being raped, sent out, war ensues, and thousands die. How did we get there? What has happened? Think of America. How did we get here? What is going on? Think about our world. Why is there wars literally everywhere? How did we get here? It's a downward spiral. Three things to end with. And let me just say this before I go into the three things. First, Samuel, if, uh, if you look there really quick, let me just throw this out just because I think it's pertinent to where we're heading in our studies. First Samuel 7, verse 6 says, So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. And then if you go to verse 15, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. The final judge is Samuel. But we're going to get into that next. But let me give you three thoughts that came from Chuck Swindoll, which I thought were good to wrap up the book of Judges and the frustration of it all. Number one, Depravity results in permissiveness when righteousness is ignored. Depravity results in permissiveness when righteousness is ignored. Number two, permissiveness leads to rationalization when holiness is ignored. You start to rationalize. It's not man's all. Who gives their all? I'm going to rationalize this a little bit. What would it mean if you gave your whole life to God? What would that do? Don't know. Don't care. I'm going to rationalize things. Permissiveness leads to rationalization when holiness is ignored. And then finally, number three, Rationalization encourages rebellion when repentance is ignored. Rationalization encourages rebellion when repentance is ignored. Rebellion. Do you think we're there as a country? One of the elements of rebellion is finding fault in everything else or everyone else. Are we rebelling in one another? Turn on a news channel and start counting and see how far you get before somebody is called dumb, stupid, wrong. We're just rebelling against each other. How does this look in your home? How does this look at work? How does this look in your relationships? Oh, to understand Ecclesiastes 12.13. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this is man's all. Otherwise, everything else is pointless and depraved and sad. We rationalize our lives. We go down a, down a downward spiral. Bondage, depression, leisure, selfishness, complacency, apathy, dependence, weakness. We go back to disobedience again. The cycle of judges. It's a sad book. It's a sad book. We all have to go to lunch now and cheer ourselves up, you know. Let's go do Mexican or something and listen to happy songs on the radio, but don't lose the point. Don't lose the point that God was very active, very desirous to make Israel great. He promised them the land, and they went in and they messed it up. Why? Because they had other things in their life that they allowed in to take the place of God. And it's just that simple. You can have habits. You can have hobbies. You can have poor time management. You can have family situations. You can have job pursuits that may not be what God wants. You may have all of these things take the place of God. And then there you are, downward spiral. You open the door. 
Are you strong enough to prevent the downward spiral? Are you focused enough, steadfast in God enough? That is the question. We all struggle with this. I struggle with this all the time. I struggle with this at work, uh, trying to make plans for the future. I make plans and they don't work out. And then I'm like, what does that mean? And, but clinging to God through it all. Love God. Keep his commandments. Fear God. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we contemplate the book of Judges. Lord, it's scary to think about how fast we can fall. I think of Cain and Abel. They had pretty decent folks. And yet, one committed murder. Father, sin is very powerful. Sin is knocking at the door of our lives each and every day. It's crouching. It's waiting for us to open the door. Like an animal seeking to devour us. Sin is right there. Every day, every moment. Every decision involves us choosing who we will serve at that very moment. It's easy to let our minds wander. It's easy to let ourselves contemplate the pains of the past that may prevent us from striving forward to godliness. We may rationalize things in our life. We may not give you our all for all kinds of reasons. But Lord, I pray that we would take the book of Judges and this study to heart. We would think on it. We will see the lessons learned and we will act accordingly. We are without excuse. We have seen how you have been angered over a life of leisure that replaces you with other things. So Father, help us to be wise. Help us to demonstrate and show our love for you because you first loved us by sending your son to die for us and to redeem us back. May our lives reflect gratitude. Help us to be grateful with our minds and our hands. Thank you so much for loving us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.